why don't you take over omnipotence and manage the whole works in your own way? You might as well ask why the negative portion of the electron doesn't take over the positive portion and run the entire works. The answer is that both the positive and the negative charges of energy are necessary to the existence of the electron. Welcome back to River Queen Conjure, Oshun Ajay Exclusive, and No Narc Network TV. I am the Oracle. Oshun Ajay. This is lesson 20, you guys, of dissecting the devil. Unfortunately, for those who only watch on YouTube, this will be the last class presented on YouTube. If you wish to partake in the remainder of the dissecting the devil lessons, click the link in the description and join the No Narc Network on Oshun Ajay Exclusive or on Badass Witch Exclusive. Okay? I am not going to hold you up my people this is lesson 20 let's get it one is balanced equally against the other stalemated as it were so it is with what you call omnipotence and I we represent the positive and the negative forces of the entire system of universes and we are equally balanced one against the other and just like the yin and yang the divine feminine and masculine sides of the twin flame union are also equally balanced if this power of balance were shifted the slightest degree, the whole system of universes would become quickly reduced to a mass of inert matter. Now you know why I cannot take over the whole show and run it my way. If what you say is true, you have exactly the same power as omnipotence. Is that true? That is correct. My opposition, you call it omnipotence, expresses itself through the forces which you call good, the positive forces of nature. I express myself through the forces you call bad, the negative forces. Both good and bad are coincidental with existence. One is as important as the other. Then the doctrine of predestination is sound. People are born to success or failure, misery or happiness, to be good or bad, and they have nothing to do with this, nor can they modify their natures. Is that your claim? Emphatically not. Every human being has a wide range of choice in both his thoughts and his deeds. Every human being can use his brain for the reception and the expression of positive thoughts. Or he can use it for the expression of negative thoughts. His choice in this important matter shapes his entire life. From what you have said, I gather the idea that human beings have more freedom of expression than either you or your opposition. Is that correct? That is true. Omnipotence and I are bound by immutable laws of nature. We cannot express ourselves in any manner not conforming to these laws. 
then it is true that man has rights and privileges not available to either omnipotence or the devil. Is that the truth? Yes, that is true. So basically, by being able to balance the yin and yang within yourself, um, having the perfect balance of God energy and devil energy, you have more freedom of expression than either one of them has alone. Okay? But you might well have added that man is not yet fully awakened to the realization of this potential power. Man still regards himself as something resembling the worms in the dust when in reality he has more power than all other living things combined. Being able to balance both the devil and God energy within yourself, you have within you the power to kill, heal, and resurrect. Definiteness of purpose seems to be a panacea for all evils of man. Not that, perhaps. But you may be sure no one ever will become self-determining without it. Why aren't children taught definiteness of purpose in the public schools? For the reason that there is no definite plan or purpose behind any of the school curricula. Children are sent to school to make credits and to learn how to memorize, not to learn what they want of life. What good is a school credit if one cannot convert it into the material and spiritual needs of life? I am only a devil, not an unwinder of riddles. I deduce from all you say that neither the schools nor the churches prepare the youths of the world with a practical working knowledge of their own minds. Is anything of more importance to a human being than an understanding of the forces and circumstances which influence his own mind? The only thing of enduring value to any human being is a working knowledge of his own mind. The churches do not permit a person to inquire into the possibilities of his own mind, and the schools do not recognize that such a thing as a mind exists. Five ways that public school brainwashes children. Number five, the Pledge of Allegiance. Most public schools begin the school day with a ritualistic Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. What many do not know is that the pledge was written by Francis Julius Bellamy, a socialist minister who worked for a children's magazine selling U.S. flags as a premium to solicit subscriptions. The magazine, Youth's Companion, promoted the placement of schoolhouse flags and Bellamy traveled across the country to design and encourage flag-raising ceremonies with the pledge. Bellamy's socialist views were tied to the pledge's stance called the Bellamy Salute, a salute where children would raise one hand toward the flag, similar in form to the later adopting Hitler Youth. While the salute was eventually abandoned due to the negative associations with the Nazis, the socialist intent remained in the language of the pledge. Teachers continued to prompt children to mindlessly pledge their lives to a unified national government before the children were old enough to understand the implications of their recital. Today, a bell's ring is often used as a Pavlonian precursor, signaling students to stand. This form of brainwashing is so pervasive that it continues to be used past grade school in sporting events and at other public gathering activities. Number four, lowered constitutional protections against searches and seizures. Children are brainwashed by schools into thinking that they do not have a fundamental right to privacy. The United States Supreme Court ruled in New Jersey v. TLO that school staff act in loco parentis, meaning an adult in place of a parent. Because of this, the Supreme Court has stated that students can be searched under a lower protection standard of reasonable suspicion rather than probable cause while in school. Not only can school staff search under this lowered standard, but school police officers, often called school resource officers, are able to search students under this lowered standard as well when they are attempting to maintain a proper educational environment. Because of this, students grow up during their formative years thinking that they do not have an ability to say no to being seized and searched, whether by a government official or by a police officer. Even worse, many children are being acclimated to a prison-like lifestyle where students must enter the campus through barbed wire fences, metal detectors, and police drug-sniffing dogs. Schools invade privacy even further for students who participate in extracurricular activities such as after-school sports, by subjecting those participants to random drug tests. This legal climate brainwashes children into accepting a privacy-free police state as the norm. Number three, historical revisionism. Public school history textbooks are often filled with language 
that brainwashes children into thinking government is the savior and private business is the enemy. Social studies and civics textbooks often state that government regulation is critically necessary to fix economic woes while ignoring the harms done by government. The Civil War is discussed as a topic only about slavery instead of the nature of federal versus state power. Franklin D. Roosevelt is praised as a savior with his New Deal while ignoring his destruction of millions of animals and crops as he grabbed control of private economy. Military intervention in other countries is viewed as an honorable duty while ignoring the millions of innocent people dead due to second and third world destabilization. Social contract theory is taught to students as an absolute truth before students can even enter into contracts themselves. Anarchy is labeled as disordered violence and democracy as ordered virtue. According to the nation's report card produced by the National Assessment of Educational progress, only 12% of high school seniors are at or above proficiency in history. This should be no surprise as American social studies courses have less to do with meaningful historical knowledge and more to do with government brainwashing for politically expedient ends. Number 2. Character Training Many schools offer a type of character training program called School-Wide Positive Behavior Supports to brainwash children into obedience. Schools will often put up character posters and guidelines to encourage students to act in accordance with school ideals. Teachers will be asked to nominate students who exhibit certain character attributes according to the character program for school-wide recognition. While this sounds like a positive approach to building integrity and camaraderie, it's actually a social manipulation program to associate government control positively with broad brush terminology. For example, when a student is given an award for the character pillar of respect, the principal may announce on the loudspeaker that the student was awarded a respect plaque because they, quote, did not talk when students were speaking or because, quote, they always obey authority. When schools make award announcement for such buzzwords like fairness, responsibility, and citizenship, they are using situational ethics to instill a peer pressure control to obey government. Students who ask too many questions or who are too willing to question the nature of the public school classroom are shamed using the buzzwords to bring the student into alignment with school control. Meaningful ethical discourse based on principles is disregarded in favor of situational ethics favoring government authority. Number 1. Classroom Behavior Management Plans Teachers actively brainwash their classrooms into obedience using a variety of tactics. During the first weeks of school, teachers carefully arrange seating and resource layout for optimal social control over students. Rules are placed for students to see, and teachers go over those rules to establish when teachers will threaten students with punishment. Teachers monitor students for adherence to the classroom procedures, called with itness and will respond swiftly to curtail any behavior that is not in line with the teacher's goals. This monitoring and immediate response to off-task behavior is to instill in children the idea that they are always being watched and controlled. Teachers methodically manipulate students, from using positive reinforcement such as verbal praise or treats to reward compliant behavior, to negative reinforcement with shushing and yelling, to using threats of punishment for non-compliant behavior like notes home and detention slips. Teachers often will use emotional manipulation with students to get desired behavior through tone of voice, choice of engagement or non-engagement in calling on students, and through gentle touches of support such as high fives and pats on the back. While at first this may seem like harmless guidance, this classroom management system denies the emotional and intellectual development of a child. A child requires extended engagement to develop robust thinking and emotional skills. Instead of receiving this, teachers substitute fleeting social manipulations because they cannot engage individual students for prolonged periods of time with a limited class period. Teachers end up creating an environment where children are reared with transient maneuverings rather than meaningful conversations. Worse, teachers who find a child troublesome will submit a child's file to a school-based team to analyze a child's behavior, working with other school personnel to manipulate a child into obedience to the school's rules. This team meeting is not limited to addressing students with violent behaviors, but includes students whose ideological discussions appear too extreme 
and must be curtailed by the school to maintain school order. Many go through the compulsory schooling processes without realizing how much coordination takes place behind closed doors by teachers, administrators, and school social workers to monitor, record, and control student thought and action. Some of this tracking and monitoring can be found by going through a student's cumulative folder at the school and by talking to exceptional student education and coordinators about school-based team tracking and interventions. You may be shocked at what you discover. Aren't you a little hard on the schools and the churches? No, I am merely describing them as they are, without bias or prejudice. Aren't the schools and the churches your bitter enemies? Their leaders may think they are, but I am impressed only by facts. The truth is this, if you must know it. The churches are my most helpful allies, and the schools run the churches a close second. So basically what he's saying is that most of um, the mainstream teachers and quote unquote preachers are in fact the devil's co-workers. Okay. On what specific or general grounds do you make this claim? On the grounds that both the churches and the schools help me to convert people to the habit of drifting. Do you realize that your charge is substantially a sweeping indictment of the two institutions of major importance which have been responsible for civilization in its present form? Do I realize it? <laughs> Man alive, I gloat over it. If the schools and churches had taught people how to think for themselves, where would I be now? If the schools and churches had taught people how to think for themselves, the quote-unquote devil would be under the foot of the children of the Most High. Okay. Now, this confession of yours will disillusion millions of people whose only hope for salvation is in their churches. Isn't that a cruel thing to do to them? Wouldn't most people be better off living in the bliss of ignorance than to know the truth about you? What do you mean by the term salvation? From what are people being saved? The only form of enduring salvation that is worth a green fig to any human being is that which comes from recognition of the power of his own mind. What if things don't end up like they're supposed to? What if this work, this energy I've invested doesn't pay off? What if I stay average? What if my story was never meant to be unique? What if I try and I fail? What if my friends stop calling? What if I let my family down? What if people don't like what I have to say? What if my idea is a little too out there? What if I'm pushing things too far too quickly? What if the worst possible scenario happens? What if I lose everything? What if success is for someone else? What if I'm meant to work, to pay bills, and to sleep? What if the starting role is just too much for me? What if I was a born follower? What if I never find happiness? What if I don't choose the right path? What if I get lost? What if I can never be as good as the person standing next to me? What if a life of meaning will always be something I'll have to stare up at? Wishing, dreaming. That would be one way of looking at things. Or what if I just change the way I look at the world? What if today is just the beginning? What if I decide who I'm going to be and become it? What if my actions can create a ripple effect that will transcend space and time? What if impossible isn't fact? What if it's opinion? And what if I don't buy it? What if this new world means that existence starts with me? What if I can be the one people look up to? What if my past got me here but has no effect on where I can go? What if every single day is a fresh start? What if I can be the one who defies the odds? What if my dreams become the standard? What if my ideas change how people see reality? 
What if the term difficult is nothing more than a cop-out? What if my doubters ignite the flame that is my success? What if my fear of mediocrity overcomes my fear of the unknown? What if second place is no longer an option? What if I make the choice to live every second of my life like it's a miracle? And what if that's exactly what every second is? What if it's time to start living like it? To start thinking like it? To never sell myself short? What if nothing good happens until I believe it? What if I stopped wasting my time trying to convince others? Because I am the only one who must be convinced. Ignorance and fear are the only enemies from which men need salvation. You seem to hold nothing sacred. You are wrong. I hold sacred the one thing which is my master, the one thing I fear. What is that? The power of independent thought backed by definiteness of purpose. Then you do not have many people to fear. Only two out of every one hundred, to be exact. I control all others. Meaning that about 98% of the world is demon-possessed or quote-unquote narcissistic in nature. Okay. Let's give the churches a rest and get back to the public schools. Your confession has shown clearly that you thrive and perpetuate yourself from one generation to another by the clever trick of taking over the minds of children before they have the chance to learn how to use their minds. I wish to know what is wrong with a public school system that permits the devil to control so many people. I wish to know also what can be done to the established system of teaching that will ensure all children the opportunity to learn, first, that they have minds, and second, how to use those minds to bring spiritual and economic freedom. I am putting the question to you definitely enough, and since you have stressed the importance of definiteness of purpose, I am here and now putting you on notice that your answer to my question must be definite. Wait a moment while I catch my breath. You have given me quite an order. It seems strange that you would come to the devil to learn how to live. I should think you would go to my opposition. Why don't you? Your Majesty, it is you who are on trial here, not I. I want the truth, and I am not particular as to the source from which I get it. There is something radically wrong with the system of education that has given us a balance sheet with life that shows us hopelessly in the red and groping for the road to self-determination as if we were so many animals lost in the jungle. I want to know two things about this system. First, what is the major weakness of the system? Second, how can this weakness be eliminated? The floor is yours again. Please, stick to the question and stop trying to decoy me into the discussion of deep abstract subjects. That's definite, is it not? You leave me no choice but that of direct answer. To begin with, the public school system approaches the subject of education from the wrong angle. The school system endeavors to teach children to memorize facts instead of teaching them how to use their own minds. In other words, the schools teach you to use your memory center to remember and hold a bunch of mostly useless facts rather than teaching you to use your imagination to create worlds and realities. Okay? Is that all that is wrong with the system? Oh no, that is only the beginning. Another major weakness of the school system is that it does not establish in the minds of children either the importance of definiteness of purpose or make any attempt to teach youths how to be definite about anything. The major object of all schooling is to force the students to cram their memories with facts instead of teaching them how to organize and make practical use of facts. This cramming system centers the attention of students on the accumulation of credits, but overlooks the important question of how to use knowledge in the practical affairs of life. This system turns out graduates whose names are inscribed upon parchment certificates, but whose minds are empty of self-determination. So most drifters graduate from college being quote-unquote well-learned, but they don't have any common sense. Okay. The school system got off to a bad start at the beginning. The schools began as institutions of higher learning, operated entirely for the select few whose wealth and family entitled them to education. Thus, the entire school system was evolved by beginning at the top and working back down to the bottom. 
It is no wonder the system neglects to teach children the importance of definiteness of purpose when the system itself has literally evolved through indefiniteness. So basically what he's saying is that, you know, working from the top to the bottom instead of from the bottom up is that college was originally designed um, for the people who had enough social status or money to be able to go. So most of the people who were going and graduating from college, their parents had basically purchased their way in and purchased their quote unquote education. OK, these were not people who were were actually passionate about the things that they had gone to school to learn. And so we end up with a lot of people who um, are not um, spiritually evolved enough to even be holding the positions that they hold giving guidance and direction to people who are more spiritually evolved and more intuitive than they are. So we have this society of underqualified narcissistic people who uh, perceive themselves to be better than those that they should actually be learning from. Okay? What would correct this weakness of the public school system? Let's not complain of the weakness of the system unless we are prepared to offer a practical remedy with which it can be corrected. In other words, while we are discussing the importance of definiteness of plan and purpose, let us take our own medicine and be definite. Why don't you lay off the schools and churches and save yourself plenty of trouble? Don't you know that you are poking your nose into the affairs of the two forces that control the world? Suppose you do show up the schools and the churches as being weak and inadequate for the needs of human beings. What then? With what are you going to replace these two institutions? Stop trying to evade my questions by the old trick of asking a counter question. I do not propose to replace the schools and churches, but I do propose to find out, if I can, how these organized forces can be modified so that they will serve people instead of keeping them in ignorance. Go ahead now and give me a detailed catalog of all the changes in the public school system which would improve it. So you want the entire catalog, do you? Do you want the suggested changes in the order of their importance? Describe the changes needed just as they come to you. You are forcing me to commit an act of treason against myself. But here it is. Reverse the present system by giving children the privilege of leading in their schoolwork instead of following orthodox rules designed only to impart abstract knowledge. Let instructors serve as students and let the students serve as instructors. As far as possible, organize all schoolwork into definite methods through which the student can learn by doing and direct the classwork so that every student engages in some form of practical labor connected with the daily problems of life. Ideas are the beginning of all human achievement. Teach all students how to recognize practical ideas that may be of benefit in helping them acquire whatever they demand of life. Teach the students how to budget and use time. And above all, teach the truth that time is the greatest asset available to human beings and the cheapest. In other words, the sooner you begin to work on learning to manifest, the more time you will have to enjoy your manifestations. Teach the student the basic motives by which all people are influenced and show how to use these motives in acquiring the necessities and the luxuries of life. In other words, find out what people need and supply that in exchange for what you want. Teach children what to eat, how much to eat, and what is the relationship between proper eating and sound health. Teach children the true nature and function of the emotion of sex. And above all, teach them that it can be transmuted into a driving force capable of lifting one to great heights of achievement. Sexual energy is a very powerful creative energy that you can use for manifestation. Teach children to be definite in all things, beginning with the choice of a definite major purpose in life. The earlier we learn to be definite in our purpose and in our focus, the quicker we learn how to create realities. Teach children the nature of and possibilities for good and evil in the principle of habit, using as illustrations with which to dramatize the subject the everyday experiences of children and adults. 
Teach children how habits become fixed through the laws of hypnotic rhythm. With this knowledge, they can either become a slave to low vibrational habits or they can use hypnotic rhythm to create the life that they desire. And influence them to adopt, while in the lower grades, habits that will lead to independent thought. Teach children the difference between temporary defeat and failure and show them how to search for the seed of an equivalent advantage which comes with every circumstance of defeat. After being cut from his high school basketball team, he went home, locked himself in his room, and cried. He wasn't able to speak until he was almost four years old and his teachers said he would never amount to much. Was demoted from her job as a news anchor because she wasn't fit for television. Fired from a newspaper for lacking imagination and having no original ideas. At age 11, he was cut from his team after being diagnosed with a growth hormone deficiency which made him smaller in stature than most kids his age. At 30 years old, he was left devastated and depressed after being unceremoniously removed from the company he started. A high school dropout whose personal struggles with drugs and poverty culminated in an unsuccessful suicide attempt. A teacher told him he was too stupid to learn anything and that he should go into a field where he might succeed by virtue of his pleasant personality. Rejected by Decca Recording Studios, who said, We don't like their sound. They have no future in show business. His first book was rejected by 27 publishers. His fiance died, failed in business, had a nervous breakdown, and was defeated in eight elections. In other words, guys, if you don't look at your failures as a defeat and you continue persevering, you'll find that within each defeat are the seedlings of a future success. Okay? Teach children to express their own thoughts fearlessly and to accept or reject at will all ideas of others, reserving to themselves always the privilege of relying upon their own judgment. In doing so, you are teaching the youth to rely upon their own innate knowing, or quote-unquote, intuition. Teach children to reach decisions promptly and to change them, if at all, slowly and with reluctance and never without a definite reason. In other words, once you've made up your mind about something or you have a vision in mind, stick to that vision until it manifests so you cannot keep changing your mind, okay? And if you do decide to change your mind, understand that you are changing your manifestation and now the universe has to work to reconfigure the new creation, okay? So it's all about being definite in your purpose long enough to receive what it is that you want okay teach children that the human brain is the instrument with which one receives from the great storehouse of nature teach them to pay close attention to all new ideas urges and impulses as well as to use their imagination to create a new positive reality they're creating with their minds anyway they just don't know it the energy which is specialized into definite thoughts that the brain does not think but serves as an instrument for the interpretation of stimuli which cause thought. Teach children the value of harmony in their own minds and that this is attainable only through self-control. Uh, uh, uh. Don't. Yeah. Zach now screams at his mum 
and pushes his little sister. And on top of it all, are you kidding me? He didn't want the ball. So this little boy is being violently aggressive towards his mother and his sister, having a tantrum because he wants something. And instead of ignoring or punishing this behavior, his mother reinforces the behavior by giving him the thing that he was having a tantrum about. Pay very close attention, parents and grandparents, because this is how narciss this is how narcissists are created. Okay? I feel like that wasn't a big deal. Just give him the whole container and he'll yeah. stop screaming. I want that. So he's learning by way of positive reinforcement from his mother for this unacceptable behavior that if he terrorizes people or throws a tantrum, it will essentially get him what he wants. Sound familiar? This is classic textbook narcissistic behavior, and this is how the diabolical narcissist is created. He will punch and kick if he wants something himself. No. Stop. No. Stop. Right now. No. No. I, to do it. I mean, generally, as a rule of thumb, he knows to behave aggressive in order to get what he wants. But then five minutes later, he'll come up to you, you know, with his thumb in his blanket and curl up on your lap. This is how the narcissist learns emotional manipulation, and this is how they come to believe that they don't owe anyone an apology for their behavior. They only need to calm down and everything will return to normal. Because of course the entire world revolves around them. And this is what they have learned, mostly from their mothers who represent in large majority the distorted and not the divine feminine. And so that's why I have a hard time disciplining him. It just yeah. breaks my heart to see him upset. And if I yell at him, yeah. it upsets him. So it breaks her heart to see him upset, okay? And so she doesn't discipline him. And this is how the narcissist learns emotional manipulation, okay? So he knows that all he has to do is act upset whenever she attempts to discipline him in order to prevent it from happening. Sound familiar? Also, because the divine or distorted feminine is not balanced, okay, with her yin and yang, male and female energies, she tends to be the over-emotional and over-accommodating type that is not properly incorporating the male energies of common sense and logic that says that, you know, your children need discipline and they need to be taught to have compassion for other people in order to be a well-rounded person. Instead, these mothers just accommodate every want of the child and so the child grows up believing that this is what the world is supposed to do for them and so a narcissist is born okay teach children the nature and the value of self-control teach children that there is a law of increasing returns which can be and should be put into operation as a matter of habit by rendering always more service and better service than is expected of them. Today, we are discussing 10 amazing kids who became self-made millionaires. Farhad Asidwala Known as one of the most promising entrepreneurs of our time, Farhad Asidwala started making a name for himself at the young age of 16. You may recognize Asidwala from his TED Talks about his company, Rockstar Media. Asidwala started his company, which is a marketing agency, at just 16 years old, and it now has more than 20 employees globally. He credits his employees for being the reason he is so successful, but we are sure his innovation and motivation have something to do with it. Harvey Millington with some quick thinking and smart investments, 14-year-old Harvey Millington was able to make himself a millionaire. He was gifted $2,000 from his father and used it to invest in a car tax disc company he started. The company ended up making a $100,000 profit and with that money, the teen invested $40,000 in a plot of land near his parents' home. Not long after his land purchase, land developers offered Millington $2 million for the land. He realized this deal was too good to pass up and accepted the $2 million offer and is now one of the UK's youngest self-made millionaires. Isabella Barrett 
She may be the youngest millionaire on this list, but that only means she has even more time to make millions. Isabella Barrett is a nine-year-old ex-toddlers and tiaras star, and she's already worth millions. The young ex-pageant queen has millions of online followers and is considered a successful businesswoman in her own right. Barrett has been able to use her social media influence to start two fashion brands named Glitzy Girls and Bound by the Crown Couture. Not only did she help develop the brand, but she is also a stakeholder in both companies. She is now predicted to be as big as the Olsen twins were in the 90s. Nick Del Wazio. Nick Del Wazio had his mind set on making millions before he even reached puberty. By the age of 15, Del Wazio had already taught himself how to code and was developing apps during his summer break. He was able to cash in on his talents when he developed the app Trim It, which helps trim down lengthy new articles. A Japanese investor saw the potential of the app and gave Del Wazio $300,000 in venture capital to perfect it. They went on to sell the end product Sunly to Yahoo for $30 million. John Kuhn John Kuhn, from a young age, understood the importance of making a profit and thinking outside the box. When he was 16, he noticed New York City was missing something, so he opened NYC's first auto parts business. He soon started making millions and was even the main distributor of parts to the MTV show Pimp My Ride. Not wanting to limit himself to the auto market, Kuhn tried his hand at fashion when he launched a fashion line with rapper Young Jeezy. Kuhn made millions more with the fashion line and is set to make billions. Ashley Qualls Proving that girls have a place in the coding world, Ashley Qualls taught herself how to code HTML when she was 14. She thought of it as an art, and to get more attention for her art, she launched a site called whateverlife.com, which showcased her work. After helping her friends design their MySpace profiles, her site started getting some real traction. Qualls decided to take advantage of the numbers by joining Google AdSense, where she got a cut of advertising revenue. She eventually went on to cut her own deals with advertisers and still brings in millions from whateverlife.com. Adam Hildreth Not only was Adam Hildreth a millionaire by 16, but he also went on to use his money to help other teens. Hildreth first struck gold with his social networking site, Dubit, which was popular in the UK. With the money from his first site, he founded and developed a company named Crisp, which is used to help protect kids from online predators. Hildreth was so successful that he made the top 20 list of UK's wealthiest teens. Robert Ney Robert Ney could have never predicted that he would earn his millions in the span of two weeks and at the age of 14. After Ney developed and released his smartphone game called Bubble Ball, it made $2 million in just two short weeks. The game was so popular, it went on to have over 16 million downloads. After his success, Ney founded his company, Ney Games, where he still continues to develop new games and apps. This proves that even overnight successes still have to work hard to keep their millions. Michaela Almer when Michaela Almer started studying bees at the age of five, she noticed that they were starting to disappear. Worried about this, she decided to start her own lemonade company using her grandmother's 1940s recipe. The catch is that she sweetens the lemonade with honey, not sugar like her competitors. Almer also donates portions of her company's revenue to bee rescue foundations. In 2016, after appearing on ABC Network's Shark Tank, the now 11-year-old secured an $11 million deal with Whole Foods. The market will now distribute her lemonade regionally with the potential to go nationwide. Shubham Banerjee After realizing the scope of visually impaired people with the lack of access to braille printers, 13-year-old Shubham Banerjee took matters into his own hands. Wanting people who read in braille to have better access to braille printers, Banerjee designed a braille printer out of Legos. The printer was so impressive it caught the eye of Intel, who invested millions into the printer. Banerjee now owns a multi-million dollar company, Brago Labs Inc., and still works on trying to find cost-effective solutions for the braille printer. Do these kids who became self-made millionaires impress you? They should. They are the epitome of what happens when you go from being undisciplined to having definiteness of purpose. Teach children the true nature of the golden rule. And above all, show them that through the operation of this principle, everything, everything, everything they do to and for another, they also do to and for themselves, for themselves, for themselves. And this ends Lesson 20, my people. If you would like to have access to the entire Dissecting the Devil series, join the Private No Narc Network. The link is in the description. This will be the last class that we um, I do premiere on YouTube. So the remainder of the classes will be made available only to the Private No Narc Network on Oshun Ajay Exclusive or Badass Witch Exclusive. Both of those links are in the description. 
description box if you wish to support the channel um, the links to cash app and paypal are also in the description box until we meet again my people keep it classy keep it clean and do what you got to do to make shit happen peace